Good, then we will continue with Martin Doll. Um, Martin is a junior professor for media and cultural studies at the University of Düsseldorf. Um, there, his uh, research interests, interests lie in politics and media, as well as audiovisual historiography, which he will, I think, get into later. Yeah. Um, in 2021, uh, in the fall, he was a senior fellow at the Marion Institute for Advanced Studies in Africa, in Accra, Ghana. And uh, what is also worth mentioning is that before his academic career, he worked as an editor and producer for public television. And with that, I give you the word. Okay, yeah, thank you. And thank you for the invitation to this event. Um, today I want to raise the question in how far decidedly, theoretically grounded historiography can be realized, not only in the form of a scholarly text, but in a scholarly informed audiovisual project. So in the following 30 minutes I would like to further develop some thoughts and present material I produced during my fellowship at the Marian Institute. Uh, you mentioned that already. Uh, the interactive documentary project is part of the three-month work of the so-called International Fellow Group 5. It was a team of scholars from Germany, Ghana and Togo and many others that were invited, but the groups itself were these three people, on the four hours in Africa, reality or transcultural aphasia. And the research team was not so much interested in practically solving the specific restitution case of around 15 looted royal insignia from the Akpini traditional area in Pandu, that is an area that belonged to the German colony Togo until 1914 or 1919. Uh, we talk about objects which are currently stored in the uh, Ethnological Museum in Berlin. The team was rather interested in investigating the complexity of restitution processes as such. And this complexity was also the, the reason for my decision not to work on a linear written paper, but to produce an interactive documentary. And by the way, this was furthermore the fruitful outcome of a longer Zoom conversation with Florian Krautkrämer, in spring 2021, in which you luckily encouraged me to experiment with this format. Without you, I wouldn't have produced it like that. I was looking for an audiovisual way of dealing with it, but I didn't know Korsakov. With my way, the way I structured the documentary, I followed the proposal of the IFG research project at Mayaza to aim at, and I quote, multiplying the voices, narratives of interest groups on local, national, and international levels, and second, multiplying the perspectives on the issues." Unquote. And by making these different positions seen and these voices heard, an interactive film might be the better medium than a text, because one can better avoid a linear, realist historical narrative. To a certain extent, a film like this is ex uh, exempted from a too homogeneous, overarching perspective, even though it is, of course, also a result of my editorial decisions. I would like to call my specific approach audiovisual historiography. It is a term I did not invent. In fact, if you search for it in scholarly journals, you'll find quite a few articles who speak of it. Nevertheless, I would like to take a slightly different understanding of it. For the term audiovisual historiography in a traditional sense is on the one hand mostly used to speak about the indispensable audiovisual materials like film, photography, sound recordings, every historian has to take into account or into consideration during his or her research process. On the other hand, it is used to speak about audio and video recordings used during the research process in order to prepare the final written result. So it always ends. In both cases, audiovisual is used as an attribute, a quality of the sources. I would like to argue that this important way of audiovisual historiography does not have to be replaced, but complemented by an audiovisual historiography that applies to the outcomes. Uh, thus, I would like to argue for an audiovisual historiography, in this case by way of an interactive documentary, which includes audio and video recordings made by myself, found footage, and interviews not only as historical sources, but also as media for the publication of scientific results. So I really follow the first presentation today, how, how you have to fight for it, to be acknowledged for this way of scholarly work, and if you do it in an audiovisual sense. 
Vivian Sapchak already stressed this in a paper from 1997. She writes, as film goers have not been able to escape the lessons of historiography, so on their side, and try as they might, historians have not been able to escape the lessons of the movies and television. Today, then, in our culture, the binary oppositions commonly posited between the transparency of the image and the opacity of the word no longer hold. That was in 1997, so we can talk about that. Indeed, to a certain extent, Vivian Sobchak's thoughts were guiding me through the production process of my film project. And as she coined the useful general term historiographic heteroclosia, I would like to adopt that, aiming, aiming at a multi-perspectivity, a multiplicity of voices and narratives about the colonial situation. It goes without speaking, but in this context I want to stress one very important point. That I'm convinced that like any other audiovisual product and audiovisual historiography, even in its interactive form, should not be mistaken as being closer to reality or something like that. It's a certain form devised by a director through his or her decisions on, for example, how to film, which material to include, how to tag it with keywords, etc. I'll, I'll get back to that later. Thus, in the beginning, my decision to produce an interactive documentary was primarily a, deci a decision not to get to something, but move away from something. How did I experience this complex field of restitution? With which problems was I confronted? And let me sum up some initial questions. First, to quote Deepesh Chakrabarti here, how to deal with subaltern pasts, stay with heterogeneities without seeking to reduce them to any overarching principle that speaks for an already given whole, unquote. In other words, how to prevent that a kind of Eurocentric colonial epistemology re-emerges in the research output, thus perpetuating a certain epistemic injustice. To exemplify this, the Open Restitution Project has recently shown that in connection with the current restitution debate, the positions of African researchers, curators, etc. are once again being voiced over by Western persons. This is at present particularly blatant with the Benin bronzes, if you look at the clear numbers. Second, how to deal with the fact that even in well-intentioned ways of dealing with restitution issues, old stereotype of Africa are repeated. The global historian Stephanie Michels, a convener of the research project in Ghana, reminds, and I quote her, and translated to in, in, into English, if the former colonial territories and the people who lived there at that time are perceived and treated in the restitution debate exclusively as the stolen, the defeated, the murdered, and the humiliated, this inadequately reduces and stereotypically or typically narrows the long history and I might add their agency. Third, theoretically I have been guided not only by Deepesh Chakrabarti and Vivian Sobchak, but very much by Helen Veran's critical reflections on post-colonialism as well. And I must admit her thoughts continue to make me scattered or haunt me to a certain extent. How to take into account the multiplicity of voices, Sobchak, without ending up at a certain differentialism or diver diversificationism, to borrow some critical terms from Veran. She warns against maintaining the purities, it's a wording from her, even within post-colonial approaches, for example, stable indig indigenous forms of knowledge on the one hand versus Western forms on the other, etc. In my opinion, this old and new essentialism constantly reappear in the audiovisual aesthetics of restitution ceremonies and exhibition openings. Following, following from this, I would like to ask how to get away from a too simple idea of authenticity that you reduces a plethora of rather heter heter heterogeneous speaking positions and interest groups to one source community or society of origin, which in turn leads very directly into the mess of essentialist identity politics. All these challenging questions led to my decision to choose the form of an interactive documentary. In order to make all the 
contradictions and ambivalences in the restitution debate visible, and this, if possible, from, and I quote from Schuhart and Stamm, polycentric perspectives. In the words of Vivian Zobczak, to show incompatible stories from incompatible speaking positions. In my opinion, the interactive interface makes it much easier to show the fragmentary speaking positions as fragmentary without joining them too smoothly. Therefore, to speak again with Sobchak, I want, was interested in a solution to present a collage of multiple versions of restitution cases. To give just one example, in German newspapers, restitution processes are often narrowed down to the following constellations. The objects were wrongly kept by the museums for too long and must now be returned immediately to the states of origin. During our field work, the field turned out to be immensely more complex. The representatives of the Akpini traditional area want to turn their cultural heritage, want to return or have returned their cultural heritage to their own chiefdom. I just show that. <coughs> yeah. The president of Ghana, Akufu Addo, in turn promotes a Pan-African Heritage Museum. The museum will provide a natural residence and resting place for all the limited cultural artifacts of our continent, which are housed in foreign museums and which will be returned to us, come what may. David Simu, a professor of German studies from Cameroon, was a guest in our project argues basically like Achille Bembe that the memory of violence, etc., associated with looted cultural heritage should be kept alive by not restituting it too quickly and pleads for a trusteeship by the UNESCO. By taking uh, all these African objects from Europe, you erase the memory of the fact that object has been stolen from Africa. And Malik Sako, chief curator of the National Museum of Accra, or Accra, reminds us not to forget the African diaspora in Germany. If we repatriate all these objects to the various African countries, what are we telling our colleagues who are in the diaspora? Are they part of the the history of Africa, or they are part of the history of Europe, because Europeans are disowning them and say that you are black, you are an African. These are just a few of the many conflicting positions I encountered, and wish to mention only three critical terms threatened to get lost in the tsunami of the current restitution Olympics in the scramble for decolonization. So these are important warnings from the Kenyan archaeologists Josh Abungu and Dan Hicks. Within this multiplicity of perspectives and positions, it was important to me to also make visible the relations of the speakers to us as an international research team, the relations of the interviewees to me as a scholarly filmmaker, and at the same time, a one-man film team. The specific conversations or meetings were anything but immediate. I would like to refer to Ray Chow's approach on cultural translation, in which he fundamentally questions traditional subject-object relations. Us and them are no longer safely, and I quote her, us and them are no longer safely distinguishable. Viewed object is now looking at viewing subject looking, thereby destroying all these kind of positions of subject and object. Thus the film, I hope, is not about predefined positions, but about relations, changing relations. In other words, the narrated memories the political positions and restitution demands were always, always clearly addressed to us or to me and acquire their own quality because of these relations. Another type of relation results from the viewing experience, at least I hope so, in, because in contrast to a linear and I repeat realist historical narrative, the network of relations that emerge during the viewing of the film between the visited lieu de mémoire, or sites of memory, desk doc documentary clips, and last but not least, the interviews, 
allow the viewers, the users of the interactive documentary to experience the perspectives both polycentrically and individually, depending on which path he or she chooses to take through the material. Depending on the path or link between the clips, their meanings change. Nevertheless, making use of this interactive mode should not obscure the fact that I, as a scholar and filmmaker, pre-sorted the material already during the recording, but at the latest during the editing. This necessarily leads to an outcome which is very much characterized by my perspective on the topic. So from the very beginning I tried to make this perspectivity as trans transparent as possible by way of some aesthetic decisions how to record. For example, through the consistent use of a mono part during the interviews, you will see it later, by establishing a clearly remarkable visual access between me and the interviewees, interviewees and the use of a directional microphone that also records room noise, atmospheres and sometimes my voice. Furthermore, I wrote my text from a first-person point of view. And last but not least, I also listed the keywords I used to structure the material in the software Corsakov on the website. As of now, I did not find a solution to make visible the so-called selectivity behind the material eventually shown, or rather not shown. Maybe you already experimented with it, I don't know. But I included a page after the end credits on which each viewer can see which clips or he, he or she actually missed. And I was in contact with Florian and he helped me to do that. It's not possible to click on them. You miss them or you have to start over. <laughs> Uh, um, to conclude, in order to leave enough time to have a closer look at the film, uh, multiplying the voices, multiplying the perspectives to take up the wording of the IFG proposal again, might necessarily also involve the multiplication of incompatible frames of reference. With this project, I eventually hope to make these different frames of reference involved in thinking about restitution in all their intricacy and ambiguity visible and audible, and to make it clear that it is necessary to think further about their relations. In the end, this might also help the viewers or interactive users to put their own, only seemingly self-evident frames of reference into perspective by way of experience how actors and interest groups in Ghana and Germany see and conceptualize restitution or reparation from their different and sometimes incompatible standpoints and with their concerns. Against this background, I want to understand my interactive film not as a panacea against the post-colonial trouble, but as one modest means to deal with it. With it. So I would like to propose just that we have a longer look at it for the remaining nine minutes, just to show the, the home page where the film is embedded. I also wrote a kind of contextual text for it and try to explain the situatedness and then I also show that the first how would you say that, that the Akpini, the people from the uh, traditional area were the first person who said, no, take this in or leave that out. Interestingly enough, they didn't want to, um, they didn't ask me to eliminate any clips. They just said, no, no, it's fine. Even the more problematic ones they kept inside. And then you, in the end, you uh, get to the film and I would like to show some excerpts. Now if I can back to the beginning, no, maybe I have to. Yeah. This, yeah, yeah, not sound it works. Maybe um, I left out the introduction where you get some texts uh, about the um, uh, project I already explained, and then it start with this snoo. <laughs> Second died in nineteen in eighteen ninety seven. Eighteen ninety seven and uh, the third angle was installed on the third of November eighteen ninety eight. 
and the German administrator, resident at Nisaoui in Togo, came down to Bando to give honor and weight to the installation of the chief. Uh, and on that day, the, 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 the German representative pinned to the chest of Dagadu the third, Dagadu Amu, the, the German colonial emblem of the flying eagle made in white gold and declared Dagadu the third king of the entire Togoland territory. By 1906, the German station was established in Bambu, whereby we have a resident uh, administration with us. Then, uh, by 1914, there was an outbreak of a disease. And uh, the German administration took charge and uh, took steps to ensure that the epidemic was contained, like how we are faced with COVID today. So a station was established at Misahoy uh, on the Togo Hills, and uh, a team of doctors and uh, health officials were dispatched to come and fill the neck of <coughs> the main citizens of our area in the effort to determine who were afflicted by the disease. And those deemed afflicted were sent to Nisaboy to be inoculated. In the process, people died. So it became an issue. Naturally, there was a, a bit of an uproar. And Chief Dagadu the third, on behalf of all the people, went to Lume to meet the Governor General, who was then von Mecklenburg, and uh, asked that the exercise be stopped. It was stopped. Much to the offense of Dr. Brunner, who made issue with Dagadu the third, who bypassed it and went straight to Lobe to see the Governor General. So, um, Dr. Krona, on the 8th of January, 1940, came heavily on the chief, was arrested, taken to Bando Toji, was then a German post, and then from there taken to Nisaway. There was a lot of uh, pandemonium in Bando. They said, those who witnessed, they said, the sun never showed in that day. You see that something truly was happening. I stop it here because we just have uh, three or four minutes left to have it all the the interactive part of it as well so you now have the the way to choose what you want to see I might show something from the Rautenstau Hughes Museum in Cologne by the way this was the clip that was um, mostly appreciated when I showed part of the first version of the film in Ghana that they saw how these objects are stored in Germany Und hier gelangen wir jetzt in den Depotbereich vom Bauzuhilfsproblem, inklusive 
den Zugang zu den benachbarten Museum und der Geschwindigkeit, aber wir konzentrieren uns auf unseren Bereich. Hier unten finden sich unsere fünf Depots und weitere Materialräume. Und unsere Depots sind aufgeteilt nach Materialien. Wir haben also einen Sonderbereich für Stein- und Metallobjekte. Und äh, die größeren Teile sind unsere Objekte, die äh, aus gemischten Materialien und organischen Materialien bestehen. Bei den Objekten äh, andere Anforderungen an die klimatischen Voraussetzungen haben. Ähm, jetzt gehen wir ins Hauptgebäude 1. Das ist das Gegenüberliegende. Maybe I'll leave it. Here it's a long eclipse, and you see that I edited uh, the material. But then you can also see the kind of museum mm -hmm. of, uh, where it is there and how it is conceived of. You already saw part of that. We must intensify our efforts at retrieving our looted cultural treasures, which are being housed in the museums of the nations that stole them from us, and making money for, for them instead of for us. Come what may, whatever the obstacles, we must get them back. I come. Uh, maybe I switch a bit to the material, so you can also have on-site visits where the National Museum this plan to be constructed. Well, you can always go back to inventory practices in Germany as well. she guides us through the, the whole processes, how to do provenance research at the museum. Maybe one last clip and then we have to stop, I think, because that was for me, bup, 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 that was for me one of the most important moments uh, during the filmmaking, to meet Ovu, who made the film You Hide Me in uh, 1968. And uh, we had a screening with him. So we're the first filmmaker who was able to get into the dungeons of the British Museum and see the objects taken away from Ghana. And there are also, this you can... This is the basement of the British Museum. This is where they keep their vast... And then you have Bob's also interview parts where he explains his uh, film making. This part of the film of the world of the world. I think for me subjectively, the first time I put out a box, one of the boxes, plastic, you know, car and you know, plywood boxes. You know, I mean I was like overwhelmed, you know, to you know arrive in a situation with all these boxes stacked with plastic bags. You know, and so on and so forth. And I had to pull out the box and open the box. And when I opened the box for that time, I was so technically overwhelmed, you know, to find what was inside this box, which I covered in plastic. And, you know, and, I mean, it was like that. So, technically, 
feeling I was very disturbed. You know, something struck me that wow. That's why the film is titled You Hide Me. Because what I discovered was hidden. You see, and if I hadn't discovered it, if I hadn't made it from nobody, probably maybe much much later on where you know academics that was the Gabon was able to visit the British Museum. But in, at that time in the 70s, there was no way anybody would have discovered what was hidden in, in the basement of the British Museum. I think I'll leave it here because time is over. Well, thanks. <laughs>